Had good service this morning. Um, you know, you, you uh, had the opportunity and the privilege to hear things that I don't know how many people on in the world, literally in the world, have been exposed to some of the things you were taught. Um, you know, I've been, been uh, I say this humbly, sincerely, been looking into the Word of God close to 40 years, and I have never seen anybody, any teaching, that laid out that understanding about Gog and Magog uh, as to why there's a difference between Ezekiel 38, 39 and the Magog of Revelation chapter 20. The only person that I know that I have ever read that has ever done that was Brother Dice. And he gave me his, <clears throat> his teaching from the Apostolic Bible College that he taught there and how he made the distinction between the Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39 and the Gog and Magog of Revelation 20. And so I honor him <clears throat> today, and I tell you today that as a church, you heard things that very few people have ever heard in the whole world. And I have studied these things, theology, for a long time, and I, I don't know everything that's in every book, but I've never come across that before. And I'm talking about high-level theologians like Dr. Michael Heiser, for one, uh, Bill, etc., on whoever. Uh, they have not pointed those kinds of things out, the distinctions that you got to hear this morning. And, and so God loves you. God loves this church. I'm just telling you, you've heard some things that a lot of people have never heard in their life. So you, are, you, know, you should consider yourself blessed. I know I consider myself blessed. <clears throat> and if, if I die before you do, throw, that, throw that, uh, that little pamphlet that Brother Dice gave me on the ages and dispensations and throw it in the casket with me because I won't take it with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. But we had, a, we had a wonderful time this morning. I had just such a liberty to teach. A lot of times I'm like, I'm amped up to the nth degree. You know, I really am. I'm amped up. And for two hours I'm amped up. But this morning I wasn't amped up. I just felt liberty to teach. I, I sort of rested in God. And it flowed, and I enjoyed teaching you this morning uh, without being so amped up. Uh, praise God, and I guess both of them's good. But Amen. this morning, I just decided I was going to take my time. And, and, and so I pray you were blessed uh, to hear the Word of God. <clears throat> what a great man of God Brother Dice was. I, I think about him all the time. He uh, just has had impacted my life in so many different ways. Uh, so praise the Lord, church. You, you get to hear some things uh, from him, even though he's with the Lord right now. Okay? So I hope it means something to you. <clears throat> We're going to be in 1 Samuel 16 tonight. <clears throat> in verse 14. <clears throat> and uh, along the lines this morning about Satan being bound in the abyss, the deep. For a thousand years, we talked about the fall line of Satan, okay, how he was in the holy mountain of God, that means the government of God, and think about it, he was the anointed cherub that covered, he was beautiful in appearance, full of wisdom, God-given wisdom, and the holy mountain of God, and uh, the way the Bible talks about him is like he was a part of the, being a worship leader. Amen, in the holy mountain of God. Uh, he was there in the Eden of God. Now, the Eden there is not the Eden uh, in the earth. It's the Eden that is in heaven. There's a heavenly Eden and there's an earthly Eden. Hallelujah. And the earthly Eden is patterned after the heavenly Eden. Amen. And so I think sometimes that's why people see the past Ezekiel 28 and say that's Adam. I believe that is correct on the one hand. Because there is a pattern in the heavens that is shown in the earthly realm. So, <clears throat> Lucifer, um, the anointed cherub that covered, beautiful, full of wisdom. All these various instruments in his body. He was a prophet, priest, and king yes. Amen. in the kingdom of God. Right. Worship came through him, and it went up to God, went through his pipes, through his instruments, and went to God. But he started wanting that for himself. Amen. But having said that, the fall line, he started in the holy mountain of God. That's the Eden that's in the heavenly realm. 
the government of God. And when he rebelled, God cast him out. Luke 10, 10 18 says, Jesus said, I, I saw. Jesus said, I saw. The only way he could do that is if he is God. <clears throat> he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Because of his rebellion, because of iniquity, he was cast out of the holy mountain of God. He um, fell, he, he was cast out. The Bible said he fell like lightning. Because of his iniquity, he became the prince of the power of the heirs. Okay. Um, Revelation 12, 12 tells us in the future he'll be cast down further. There's a further fall line. He's cast down further into the earth. Revelation 20 then tells you that he is cast down even lower into the deep, the abyss. It's not over yet. He gets cast down even further, Revelation 20 and verse 10, into the lake of fire. So that's the fall line of Lucifer. Now, think about it where he was and where he's going to end up. And God knew what he was going to do. But God did not create him to be this. He created him to be the anointed chair of the covers. And so even though God, and, and how is that possible? Because he gave this, live, this spirit being, if you will, the freedom of choice. And that's dangerous. It's a blessing, but it can also be dangerous. God didn't take his freedom of choice away. It's a blessing, but can it be dangerous? And, and so he exercised his will against the will of God. And because of that, he rebelled against God. And because of that, he was cast out. Amen. Now, I was thinking about it today. Think about, even though God is God, uh, put it in my, my human level of thinking, how disappointed God was. Amen. Because he gave him everything he needed, wisdom and beauty and the, the ability to serve prophet, priest, and king. Man. Really. Uh, that's why you should not underestimate him. Because even Michael the archangel doth not bring a railing accusation against him. He said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And so when you start underestimating him, you under underestimate his power. You forget at one time where he used to be. And that's why you don't bring a raiding accusation. Right. You, you, listen, you have to be careful <clears throat> even bringing a raiding accusation against somebody who was in a position of authority, amen, amen. amen. That, may, that may have fought, fell, fell because of where they used to be. <clears throat> and because of how God created him originally and where he used to be as prophet, priest, and king. When he got cast out, he still has his power. And he's still got wisdom, but it's satanic. So he's, he's wise. And it's corrupted, but he's wise. And he's powerful. Hear what I'm telling you. So don't ever underestimate that, that, that creature. Right? So, anyway, what a disappointment. Because God didn't create him to, to be here. He created to be here. Amen. And he created me to be here and not here. And he created you to be here and not here. But what a horrible disappointment it would be. After having been made to be here, we end up here. You know? Created to be a winner in God's kingdom. And not living up to that expectation. And becoming a loser. I mean, you can think of things right now in this world where there's great expectation that somebody's going to win something, they end up losing, and everybody goes. What a disappointment is what they do, right? So tonight, I'm going to be talking about these things to you. And we started this morning. And so this, uh, eventually Satan is going to be bound in the bottom of his pit. Um, I will tell you, brothers and sisters, that his role is to deceive the nations. And that word in the BDAG lexicon literally means to cause people to go astray. That is his chief tactic is deception. Okay. All right. So I already preached the first message to you. But 1, King, uh, 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, 
And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is cunning, a cunning player on a harp. It shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Well, they respond to him and they say, uh, There is the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, and that's, of course, David. And then verse 19, Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent him by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now, and we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> So, as I was saying, we do not underestimate, and we should not estimate, underestimate the power yes, sir. of Satan. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. There is only one that is more powerful right. than Satan That's or the right. devil. That's right. Amen. And that one is God. That's right. And that's why Michael, because of his original position, said... I'm not going to bring a railing accusation against him because he said, I'm going to say the Lord will rebuke you. Right. So the enemy that we have is real. Right. And it's a spiritual battle that we are in. Yes, sir. One of the things that I want to address today is sometimes as a Christian, he seeks to torment your mind. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 And it's like, it's like a torture. It's like a torment. Thoughts are coming in your mind, and <clears throat> you know what I'm trying to say. And so it's a spiritual battle that's, that is taking place. <clears throat> so one of his chief tactics <clears throat> is to torment the saints. Amen. Now, uh, should we live like that? No, sir. Does God want us to be tormented in our minds all the time? No, no, that's not God's will for you to be tormented in your mind, to be tormented by the enemy in your mind, right? No. Or troubled all the time. That's not God's will. He doesn't want that. But sometimes the enemy comes like that. And the reason why the enemy was allowed to touch Saul and trouble him like that. And I know it says from a spirit from God. But, you know, anyway, I'm not going to try to explain that. But I will tell you that oftentimes the reason why the enemy can torment us is because there's rebellion in us. Praise the Lord. Now, you haven't been glorified yet, and I haven't been glorified yet. And so because of that, we still carry within us the, the seeds of rebellion, fallen nature. All of us do. And so sometimes, and we see in the life of Saul, because of his rebellion against the Word of God, this spirit is able to come and torment him and torture him. Now, the remedy is that uh, David would come. And David would begin to worship, and David would begin to play, and, and, and sing, sing songs of worship to God. And when he did that, the Bible said the evil spirit left. Have you ever come to church and you were just really in battle, mental battle, tormented in your mind, you know, just really going through it in your mind, and you get in the house of God, and you start worshiping, worshiping and praising the Lord, and that, that cloud, that darkness, that spirit, that oppression, it lifts off of you. Because it, there's a spiritual weapon that we use. We don't, <clears throat> amen, we wrestle against uh, spiritual things. So the weapons of our, our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And a stronghold, get this, is the devil's power. So we, have, we are responsible to pull down those powers of the enemy, those strongholds of the enemy. And they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I'm preaching to you today a message of victory, not a message of defeat. So whenever the enemy comes against your mind or whatever, 
You have the ability to pull those powers down, those attacks down, those, those strongholds. And say they are done with spiritual battles, spiritual weapons like praise and worship. It's a spiritual. Have you ever wondered why when you come to church sometimes it's so hard to press through your praise? Amen. You know why? Because the Bible said he's sitting on the congregation, congregation in the sides of the north. He wants to set on your praise. He wants to set on your prayer <clears throat> so that you don't pray and you don't worship because he knows there is power in your praise. There's power in your prayer. <clears throat> Amen. And, and a lot of times we come to the house of God and uh, not only we have in battles in our mind, but our soul, emotion. You know, because the soul is the mind, will, and emotions of a person. And we come to the house of God and we're dealing with battles in the mind, thoughts. We're dealing with battles in the emotions. Now, listen, brothers and sisters, we, you can't be led by your emotions. <laughs> you have to be led by the Spirit of God. Now, God gave us emotions, and thank God for the emotions that He gave us. But if we allow ourselves to be completely led by emotions... Hear what I'm going to say. We'll never do anything for God. <clears throat> See, there's a, high, a higher thing that we should be led by, and that's the spirit of the living God. <laughs> not emotions, not feelings, not, you know, praise God, all these thoughts that are going on in my mind, praise the Lord. So we can have victory in these battles, satanic battles that come against our mind, to torment us, uh, you know, this is the point of the message tonight, victory in Jesus Christ. Before I get to that, though, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this, this spirit being. <clears throat> Revelation 20 tells us that he goes out to deceive the nations, and that literally means, you know, connected with, as I've already said, the torment and all these things that go on in the mind, the battle of the mind, really, that's where the battle is right there, it's in your mind, okay? <clears throat> the emotions that we have. But he's also involved in seeking to deceive the nations. That means to lead people astray. The lexicon means literally to lead people astray. So his ultimate goal, if he can get us to go astray, then that's what he's after. And he, he seeks to deceive nations that way. And we talked about it this morning. <clears throat> now, there is a difference, brothers and sisters, between sin in the spirit and sin in the flesh. And this is where David, uh, not David, but Saul had his problem. David committed some sins in the flesh. But Saul's sin was in the spirit. Woo. Saul, now that's, if you study, and we've talked about this before, you study the life of David and you compare it to the life of Saul, you kind of wonder how in the world God forgave David. But yet Saul, man, I, I, I believe, I don't think he ever was recovered. And the reason is because Saul's sin was in the spirit. It wasn't just in the flesh. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, what I'm telling you is that sin in the spirit is worse than sins in the flesh. And the reason is, is because Satan was the first spirit being that rebellion was found in. And so when you define iniquity, iniquity is rebellion against divine authority. I'm going to say it again. Rebell or iniquity is rebellion against divine authority. That is a sin that's in the spirit. It is harder to get rid of sin in the spirit rebellion against divine authority than it is to get rid of sin in the flesh. Don't lift your hand, okay? But at some point in every one of our lives, we have had a trouble and a challenge submitting to divine authority. Where does that come from? Why do we have so much trouble in submitting to authority? It comes from that Spirit being. 
He's the first one that rebelled in his spirit. He was a spirit being when he rebelled against the divine authority of God. And so this is why Saul was so tormented. Was because his sin wasn't just a sin that was in the flesh. It was a sin that was in the spirit. He rebelled against God Almighty's authority. If you and I, say, I'm going to tell you tonight, brothers and sisters, if that spirit ever tries to get a hold of you, where you want to rebel against authority, as soon as it comes around you, you send it down the road. Because the more you allow that in your life, the harder it is to get rid of that kind of uh, sin because it's something that's in a spiritual matter. And if we rebel against God and we rebel against divine authority, what we are doing is we are rebelling against everything that has to do with God's control. If I rebel against God, His divine authority, what I'm saying, God, is this. God, are you understanding? I am standing against everything that you control, God. If you stand against the things that God controls. Hear me. If you stand against the things that God controls. You put yourself in direct competition with God himself. And that's why sin in the spirit is so dangerous. Because now you are competing with God. You put yourself or I put myself on the throne. And when you do that, you're com- competing with uh, the things that God controls. Say praise the Lord. And so this is why Saul ended up like he did because his was a deeper, deeper sin. Not, not that, you know, one is, shouldn't be committed and whatever should. I'm not getting that. I'm just telling you that sin of the Spirit, rebelling against divine authority, iniquity is a big deal. Amen, amen. Woo! Hallelujah. You don't want that in your life. Especially if you're a parent. Because that spirit, if it gets a hold of a parent, it'll be start to start be manifested in the children. That, that, that's why I would say, brothers and sisters, whatever uh, location, it's the job or if it's at the school or if it's a church or whatever place it is, and there's some kind of authority there, you as a parent, don't get on the side of that kid if they're in rebellion against that authority. Don't you dare do it. Because you are teaching them how to rebel against authority. And that is a huge problem. It's a sin that was committed by Satan. He was the first spirit being that did it. And iniquity was found in him. And when you do that, you operate by the devil's principle. And that's what happened to Saul. So God told him to do certain things and he didn't do it. So he put himself in direct competition with God himself. And as a result of that, then he's got problems. His spirits start talking, uh, tormenting him. And, and so David comes along. And as he exercises spiritual weapons of praise, the Bible said that spirit phew, would leave Saul. Now watch that. It doesn't say that Saul was worshiping God. It says David was worshiping God. And when David was worshiping God, the power that was in that worship caused the spirit to lift off of another person. So whatever you're dealing with, if you're dealing with uh, some kind of rebellion, iniquity, against divine authority, the answer is to worship God. And as you worship God, that spirit has to leave. It has to go. And the reason is because you're relinquishing your sovereignty and you're recognizing God's sovereignty. And the Bible says that He is enthroned upon the praises of Israel. He inhabits the praises of Israel. That means He's enthroned. So as you worship God, you're putting Him in His rightful place of authority. And when you do that, the devil can't hang around. Because, listen... There is power in praise. There is power in worship. Don't let the devil take your praise. Don't let him take your shout. 
Don't let him, don't let him torment your mind continually. Oh, hallelujah. Who oh, praise God. Worship God and watch God do things. These strongholds will come down. You will be able to walk victorious in the kingdom of God. When Satan then rebelled against God and he shows up in the Garden of Eden, he tempts Adam and Eve to rebel against God as well. When Adam yields to that temptation of the devil, then a nature that wasn't in Adam before becomes a part of him. So that Adam got sin from the devil. Let me ask you then, okay, just for the sake of teaching. Where did, where did Adam get his sin nature? He got his sin nature from the devil. That, that's your first nature, by the way. Your first nature and my first nature is that old sin nature. Adam got it from the devil. That's the nature, that fallen nature. Sins, plural, are the actions of that sin nature. Important what I'm about to tell you. In the book of Galatians, which we are covering on Wednesday night, Paul talks about sins in the flesh. You with me? Say sins in the flesh. Or, or the flesh. I mean, he, he, just, he just calls it the flesh. So when he calls it the flesh, he's talking about sin. The flesh equals sin. So that sin nature that's on the inside of every one of us, Adam got that sin nature from the devil. We got sins, plural, from Adam. And the sins, plural, those are the actions of the sin nature, are called the works of the flesh. So the sin nature is the well, and the sins that we commit, cussing, drinking. <laughs> you want me to get practical? Cussing, dipping, drinking, have it, whatever, just call it, just list it, right? That's the dirty water in the well. You right? You understand? So you got the well, that's the sin nature, and the sins, the actions of, of the sin nature is the dirty water in the well. Amen. Amen. Say praise God. Wow. So we have this sin nature inside of us, this fallen nature, and that produces the dirty water in the well. Praise God. Amen. So we need to be victorious over spiritual sin which was rebellion against divine authority that is a sin that's in the spirit. Don't ever let that get inside of you. Now, some of you might not want to like what I'm say, but that's why God says when it comes to your children, you have to discipline them to get that out of them. Because by nature, they're born with that. It takes a little bit of action. <laughs> okay, and, and God, God, he's the one that said to do it. He's the one that told you how to discipline your children. Why? Because he knows left to itself, it will destroy. And you got to drive it out. Woo! Oh, come on, church. You start, and now watch this. Now listen to me. Please listen to me. There are certain situations that come up in the church uh, with certain young people or whatever. My question is always this, right? When they're doing things or they're saying things, my question to the parent is, are they rebelling yet? We well, got quiet in here. And if the parent tells me, no, pastor, they're not rebelling against me, we got hope. But if those actions move into rebellion, you got a problem. And you can't just sleep on that. 
You, you can't just hope for the best. You're going to have to deal with it. Because if you don't, brothers and sisters, right now, let's say they're rebelling against some other authority, pretty soon they'll turn on you. Hear what I'm telling you. Okay. So sins in the spirit, sins in the flesh. They're different. Amen. Now, I remember one time somebody came in the office, and, and I'm, not, I'm not going back and rehashing the hash. I'm just giving, using this as an example. Amen. They came into my office, and they, there was a challenge with, with one of their children, and it was an older child. And uh, they wanted to stand up and, uh, you know, protect them and defend them. And so I just looked at the brother, and I said, brother... I said, are you sure you want to put yourself in that position? You want to be the advocate to this person? I asked him. I said, you better be careful. You're trying to be an advocate to that person. I said, are you sure you want to do that? Well, brother, sister, with, with, over time, it ended up not being a good thing. So before you put yourself on the side of rebellion, ask yourself the question, do I want to put myself in that position? Because if you do, what's going to happen is eventually that rebellion that's being manifested against somebody else, they're going to turn it on you. Now, I'm just being practical tonight. So there's a difference of sin in the Spirit. I ask that question. Okay, where are they right now in the Spirit? Are they rebelling against you? No, they're not rebelling against me, Pastor. Okay, then you got hope. But if it ever switches over to that other, where there's rebellion and all of that going on against divine authority... You got something major on your hands because that is the principle of the devil. Amen. It's not just something going on in the flesh. It's not just the muddy water in the well. Okay? So when you talk about, Paul talks about the works of the flesh, he's talking about sins that are committed in the flesh. Okay, amen. Now, here's the good news. That in God... As we worship God, we can be victorious over the sins of the flesh. We can be victorious over the sin nature. We can be victorious as we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God. Amen. We can be victorious over satanic attacks against the mind, emotions, whatever. I can be victorious. Why is that? Because Jesus Christ at His work on the cross, the Bible said, now is this world judged? Now is this the prince of this world cast out? Amen. So his work on the cross is a work that you and I can walk in and be victorious over the enemy of our life. Sins of the flesh, sin nature, spiritual battles that take place. Look at your neighbor and tell him you can be victorious. You've been tormented in your mind, you can be victorious. God doesn't want you to continue allowing that to happen. Praise God. Take authority. I told him this morning, you have to take dominion over the enemy. Because if you don't, he'll load your couch up. He'll load your house up. He'll drive off with it. you got to tell him, no. You're a thief. You can't take that. And so when he comes to try to take your peace, take your walk with God, you have to take dominion and authority over him. That means you have to enforce what Jesus Christ did for you. And that's victory in the Lord. So we do that by praise. We do that by prayer. Say hallelujah to the Lamb. Beautiful, isn't it? Daniel. He prayed. There was a spiritual battle going on in the heavenly realm. And he prayed. And he prayed. He fasted, what, 21 days? Now watch. This shows you the prince of the power of the air. That you and I have to pray, and you have to be fervent in prayer, and you have to be persistent in prayer. Amen. You have to be fervent in worship, and you have to be persistent in worship. Amen. Because it's kind of like this. You have to punch holes yes. in that realm. Yes. And as Daniel prayed, and as he fasted, that released help from the spirit world to come. And that way the enemy could be defeated. How do you do it? By prayer and fasting. So we can be victorious as we see in Saul's life by praise and singing and worshiping God. In Daniel's life by prayer. And he was such an awesome prayer warrior and such an awesome man of God. That when he prayed, the spirit world 
changed and it moved. And they took him because of that prayer. Satan took him and cast him in a pit. Because Satan knew that what was happening through Daniel as he was praying is that Daniel was defeating his kingdom. And so he, th- that spirit rose up in a ruler said, we got to stop this man from praying. Because when he prays, he's doing harm to my kingdom. And so he rose up through a ruler and had him cast into a, li- a den of lions, brothers and sisters. Well, the enemy wants to stop you from praying. Because every time you pray... See, it's like this. The Bible says sometimes the heavens over you, over your head is like brass. And you pray and it looks like it just gets hit in the wall and you can't get through. And so what you have to be is like Daniel. You have to be persistent. You have to keep hitting that wall, keep hitting that ceiling until you knock a hole in it. And when you knock a hole in it, then God can bring an answer to you. Praise God. And Daniel knew the power of prayer. It took him 21 days of praying and fasting until the answer came. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, some of you are looking for an answer. It's not going to happen overnight because you got to knock a hole in that. You got to knock a hole. You gotta, there's got to be an opening there so that help can come and an answer can come. It's not going to happen overnight. You got to be persistent. I said you have to be persistent. You have to keep knocking. You have to keep praying. And if you do, then you will be victorious. Satan was threatened by Daniel. And so that's why he rose up. He was threatened by his prayer. So by praise and by prayer, we can be victorious over the powers of darkness. The Bible talks about as we pray, as we read the Word of God, as we teach the Word of God to you, as we hold on to Jesus Christ, every day in our life, I'm holding on to Jesus. Every day in my life, I, I want to be in prayer. Every day in my life, I want to be in the Word of God. Because as I'm in the Word of God, as I'm praying, as I'm worshiping, as I'm holding on to Jesus every day of my life, that gives me victory over the kingdom of darkness and Satan's strategy. He will not be able to deceive you if you hold on to the Word of God and you pray and you worship. You hold on to Jesus. He will not be able to overcome you or I in this war. You will be victorious. In the kingdom of God. Because brothers and sisters, and this is the last thing I'm going to say before I let you go. Is that according to Ephesians chapter 2, we are hid in Jesus Christ. So don't walk out of here tonight fearful. Don't miss. Listen. Don't underestimate His power. But don't walk out of here in fear and torment and worry. Because I am hid In Christ Jesus. He said, I'm seated together with Him in heavenly places. And because you're hid in Jesus, and because I'm hid in Jesus, that means the enemy can't get to you if you're hid in Jesus Christ. So by prayer, by worship, by holding on to the Lord. Amen. Being hid in Christ, we can have victory. Victory. Over all the assaults of the enemy that would come against our minds. Would you stand? Satan lost when he rebelled against God. And and to this day, he still thinks he can set up a counterfeit kingdom. To this day, he still thinks he can usurp. What God controls in a competitive way. And he's going to find out as he's gradually dealt with 1,000, the number 1,000, 1,000 years, 10 times 10 times 10. Am I saying it right? 10 is, is the base. Base 10 is our numeric system. It's not base 7 because if it was 7, you would start over at 7. But it's base 10. So when you get to 10, you have to start over back at 1. So 10 plus 1 is 11, right? 
All right, so we have a base 10 numeric system. So when we have 10 times 10 times 10, you've got totality times totality times totality. Or completion, completion, completion. And what God is doing, brothers and sisters, even in this moment by His church, He works through you, the church, His body, to defeat the enemy. To defeat what He's doing in the earth. To hinder what He's doing in the earth. And ultimately, he will totally, 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 completely defeat the devil. But right now, he's using the church. He's using you. He's using his word. He's using his spirit. And when you walk in victory, he is defeated, praise God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And so the enemy is going to find out. He should already know by now. But he's going to find out that he's lost. It's, yeah. Satan will find out he's a loser. Nebuchadnezzar found out that he was a loser. The Bible says one day he got lifted up in pride, that spirit thing. That pride, yeah, God, yeah. that starts in that pride, yes. and we all got some pride. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's right. and that pride was called Satan to fall. That's the principle of the devil. Yes. It's pride. And one day Nebuchadnezzar walked out and he saw the great empire of Babylon, and he said, "Is this not great Babylon, which I have made?" And as soon as he started taking credit for what was built, come on, because of that pride, the Bible said at that moment, he got the heart of a beast. And he roamed around for seven years out there in the garden. It's like a wild animal. His hair grew like the feathers of a bird. His fingernails like the claws of an animal. Because he refused to recognize that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. And gives it to whomsoever he will. And when he let that pride get a hold of him and said, This is great Babylon that I have, have made. God said, Oh really? Let's see what you can do. And he gave him the heart of a beast for seven years. That's a picture of what's coming. I said this morning, as we get closer and closer toward the end times, according to Revelation chapter 20, we see an increase of satanic activity and attack against the church of the living God. It is not going to get easier as we get closer to the coming of the Lord. It's going to get more intense. And in that seven-year tribulation period, the world is going to go insane. They're going to go mad like Nebuchadnezzar did for seven years. Until finally they recognize that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomsoever He will. And after that seven-year period of time, the Bible said He lifted His eyes to heaven. And he recognized, acknowledged that God, the most high God that rules in the kingdoms of men. Oh, brothers and sisters, Lord God, let us not walk in pride and arrogance, Lord. Let us not talk about how great we are and what we have performed, Lord God. Let us always glorify you, Lord Jesus, in all things. That's what the Bible is showing you. Is coming upon this world. People's minds being tormented. Insanity getting hold of people. And it's because they refuse to recognize the sovereignty of God. And they put themselves in a competition against God. Oh, I want to cooperate with God. I want to cooperate with the Spirit of God. Every time you praise Him, you're saying He's the King. Every time you worship Him, you're preparing a throne for Him. him. 
I declare in the spirit right now, I already feel something has broken. It has broken. By the spirit of God and by the word of God. I declare victory in this house. I declare victory in your life. I declare it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you lift up your hands and worship and lift up your voice and praise unto this awesome God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I take dominion over every addiction. I take dominion over every torment of the mind. I take authority in the name of Jesus. Right now, Father God. Hallelujah, the pride that gets in our hearts. I, I take authority, Lord Jesus. We humble ourselves before you, God. We exalt your name. We praise your name. We worship your name. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The strongholds of the enemy, his power, it's, it's, it's like this. It's like the coils of that serpent slowly wraps around your life, wraps around from the bottom of your feet all the way to the top of your head, and pretty soon a spirit captures your mind and captures your life. But in the name of Jesus right now, the Bible said you shall tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And there shall by no means anything hurt you in the name of Jesus. Woo, we declare in the name of the Lord God the victory that we have in Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Another tactic of the enemy is division. He, seek, he seeks to bring division into the body of Christ. Division means two visions. That's why Paul, in dealing with the Corinthian church, you know, he talked about a messenger of Satan was sent to buffet him. And what, what was that? that was, there were spirits that were coming in, messengers of Satan, that were coming into that body, see. And uh, he recognized that the spirit behind them was the enemy. Um, and so that's why he dealt so patiently, lovingly, kindly, with truth, with the word of God, to get rid of that out of the church because what he saw was a division coming into that body. Vision is, a division is two visions. And ultimately what happens when you have two visions is you've got a church within a church. And when you have a church in a church, it don't work very well. There's only one vision in a church, not a division. And with that vision in a church comes provision. The enemy seeks to create a division in this church. 
And that means to raise up a church within the church. No, you are the body of Christ. We are to walk in unity. Hallelujah. Give God worship in the house. Powerful, powerful. The good news is that God won in the Corinthian church. He won. That vision came back in. And it wasn't a divided place. It wasn't a divided house. God got the victory over the enemy. Father, we ask God that there would be more unity in this body. You're the head. We are the body. Let your thoughts be our thoughts, your mind be our mind, your will be our will. You're the head of the body, the church. Amen. He prayed in that high priestly prayer of John 17. He prayed that the body would be one. Brothers and sisters, if we stay in unity and we stay one and not try to create a division in the house, a church in, inside of a church, God will be able to manifest His power and His presence and His will in this assembly. In the name of Jesus. There are some things that we do that find us personally inconvenienced. And we do them for the sake of the body, for the sake of unity. And it, it, yeah, it will create some sacrifice at times on our part. But we have to be willing to make that sacrifice as a body. For the sake of unity, for the sake of the church, praise God. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. And, you know, there, there are times when you get to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, and how you want to do it, and that's okay. But there's sometimes when the body is going to come together in unity Amen. that we have to be willing to say, you know what? Yeah, it's going to be a little bit inconvenient for me, and uh, I'm going to have to sacrifice some things, but, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you uh, because I want the body to be put together. I want the body to be one. I, yeah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It, 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 it's a little challenging. It, yes, it's challenging it at times. It's hard work at times, and it's difficult at times. But let God be glorified. Let God be honored. Thank you, Jesus. So I'd, I'd rather have a small church that's in unity. Then a big, big church that's divided and, you know, all over the place. Amen. Because Jesus, Jesus, that's what his will was. He said that, that we may be one. Even as he's one with the Father. Lift up your hands and let's worship God. Let's, let's ask God for the spirit of unity. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I hear the shout of a king in our midst. Would you lift your voice up right now? Come on.
Praise God, church. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. God is training us, isn't he? In his kingdom right now, he's training us. and We're learning how to flow in the spirit. We're learning how to pray. We're learning how to rule. We're learning how to reign. We're learning to have, to have dominion. Amen. Right now, because in the future, in the kingdom. All that training that you're going through right now. You're going to see it in the future, in the kingdom age. When God sets different people. There, there may be, in the kingdom age, you're going to go to a city or a town. And you're going to see one of your brothers sitting on a throne. You're going to see one of your, maybe your brother, your sister's ruling in that place and having dominion. You say, hey, how'd you get there? Well, I got there because I was willing to learn. And I was willing to be trained. And that's why David, when David came forth, he came forth from a position of being trained. He, he was trained by God out there in the wilderness to play a harp, to worship God. He worshiped God out in the wilderness. He sang songs in the wilderness. That was his school. That was his training. And when he got in the court of Saul, all that training out there in the, in the wilderness watching sheep. Don't mess with a shepherd. Shepherds are strong. Shepherds are powerful. Shepherds scare the enemy. Oh, hallelujah. That's why the enemy will come after a shepherd. Because the enemy is afraid of a shepherd. David went out there. He learned. God told him. Taught him out there watching the sheep. How to play that harp. How to sing the songs of Zion. And he walked in a, pra- in a place of spiritual warfare. And when he played that song from his position of being trained, powerful things begin to happen. Give God praise in the house. Don't be discouraged when you're going through training. Oh, up. Uh. I feel that in the spirit. I don't want anybody to shout too loud when I say this. But some of you are getting tired. It seems like you can't do anything right. <laughs> okay? And, and you're getting tired of the correction that's coming to you. Despise not the day of small things. Come on, hear, what, hear, hear, hear the word of God to you tonight. You're not being picked on. You are being prepared. You are being trained. You are, you are being taught. Being, you're learning how to have dominion, how to function, how to have order. Function in the order and the government of God Almighty. Not just spirit, but in order. And there's got to be a lot of stuff, a lot of training that goes on in our lives to get some stuff out of us that are disordered. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Don't quit God when God comes and corrects your life. God is training you for the future. Would you lift your hands and worship God? Yeah. Yeah, so I want just look I want you to I want you to understand if you feel like that, join the club. <laughs> Cuz I often feel like that myself. I really do, but it's okay. Cuz I know God has got a purpose for all of it. Amen. And uh, hallelujah, God God's God's teaching us. And I'll let you go after this after this thought. Either we're going to be willing to learn or we're going to be taught. I I want to be willing to learn instead of being taught. Because if if I've got to be taught, that means I wasn't willing to learn. And I know know you might not understand what I'm saying, but I think you get the spirit of what I'm saying, right? How many of y'all are willing to learn? Then guess what? You don't have to be taught. If you're not willing to be learned, somebody's going to teach you something. <laughs> Say praise the Lord. And, and it, so I'm just, I want to be willing to be trained so I can be used in the kingdom of God now and in the future. Oh, yes. See, in some of these little practical things that we're sharing with you right now, that's defeating the enemy as, as powerfully 
as some of the other things we said tonight. Amen. Okay? Amen. Praise God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. He's going to bring all of us out of a crucible, out of, a crucible of fire. Woo! It's going to get hot. But he's making a vessel of honor. Let's worship God one more time. Let's praise him one more time. Listen, I'll let you go, but you know what? I know David, in those months and years, he was running for his life from Saul. Going through so much pain in his life. I mean, you study the story in the same context of what I read to you. And over and over and over and over, there was Saul ready to, to throw a javelin and pin him against the wall. And eventually he'd have to run for his life, you know. And uh, for a long time, Saul tried to kill him. And I'm sure in those days when he was out there wandering like a partridge in the wilderness, lonely, hurting at times, going through so much pain, probably wondering why. Why is this happening to me? I played for that man so that that spirit would lift off of him. I was his armor bearer. How is it now this is turned the way it is? And he went through a long time of pain and suffering. And I know he got tired. You can read the Psalms and, and he's just at the end of himself at times. And throwing up his prayer to God for help. You know, just didn't know what else to do, you know. Not understanding why. The whole time God had a plan. God was molding him and making him and preparing him to be the king of Israel. And if he had not gone through all of that, experienced all of that pain and that suffering, he could not have ruled as a king. So tonight maybe there's somebody that's being ministered to by this word. God is preparing you to rule and to reign. Amen. And sometimes you've got to go through a lot. You've got to go through a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of suffering. Amen. But God knows what He's doing. How many of y'all believe that tonight? That God knows what He's doing. I believe God knows what He's doing. The Bible shows those martyrs in Revelation chapter 20 that were beheaded. They didn't take the mark of the beast. They were beheaded. And as soon as they were beheaded, their spirit went straight into the divine counsel of God and was involved with God administering His kingdom. Involved with the judgments of God. And that divine counsel, it took death to put them there in the spirit. And then later in the resurrection, they'll be there. Oh, praise God, church. Praise God. God is not allowing these things to come in your life for your destruction. Yes. He's allowing them to come in your life to make you a woman and a man of God. Let's give God the praise if you believe He's in control. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father God, thank you for your word tonight. Meeting with us. Hallelujah. We are seated together with you in heavenly places right now in Christ Jesus. We are hitting you right now, Lord God. 
Oh, hallelujah. Hidden in your house, God. Praise God. Let's lift our hands and worship God. Let's give Him praise. Praise God. Amen. Lord Jesus, that you would be glorified tonight, that you would be honored, Lord, by our lives, by the word that has gone forth, the worship and the praise, the prayer, the service of your people. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's something that keeps coming in my spirit, so I'll just share it with you. You know, the Bible talks about baptism of water, baptism of the spirit. It also talks about a baptism of fire. And, and oftentimes that's interpreted like to mean when you get the Holy Ghost, you're, you know, you're baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. But it, it could also mean... You're going through a personal baptism of fire, okay? Yeah, amen. 
Just recognize, just recognize it, all right? God's not trying to destroy you or harm you. It's just He's trying to prepare you for something in His kingdom. Let's love Him. Let's worship Him one more time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, Lord. Woo, praise God. My. You will see oftentimes when you're about ready to give up, you're about ready to quit. That's when a breakthrough is coming in your life. Don't quit. Don't give up. Because there's a breakthrough coming in your life. You won't see it if you quit. Oh, yeah. Jesus, in your name, I receive it tonight. I receive that word tonight. I thank you for it tonight, God. Yeah, Lord. Yes, Lord. Listen. He knows the conversations that you are having. He knows the words you are saying. He is saying to you, do not do it. Do not quit. Your breakthrough is coming. He heard that, what you said. But he says, don't do it. Your breakthrough is coming. Now worship God and give him praise. Hallelujah, King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. You don't, listen, you don't need a geographical relocation. You need a spiritual understanding. Let's give God worship in the house. Let's give Him praise. God has planted you in a body. God planted you in that body. Woo, praise God. Amen. Let's, let's just tap our hands into the Lord and praise Him right now. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to let you go. There is absolutely nobody coming to me and talking to me individually about things you're saying. It's not happening. I'm telling you right now. But God oftentimes will so pinpoint what is going on in your life that you think somebody's been on the phone. God is saying to you those things because there's nobody giving me any private information about you. Man, I got the Holy Ghost all over me. Ooh, hallelujah. Won't you lift your hands and let God just baptize you right now? Woo, powerful. In fact, your breakthrough is not coming. Your breakthrough is now. It's now. It's now. Who is mighty and true?
In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Holy, O Lord, are you, O Lord. Hallelujah. Woo. To God be the glory. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, you're so good. You're so good. You're so good. You're so good. <laughs> Woo. Mm. Yeah, that's it. I know. That's right. So you can be, you can be in a church setting, and right before church, you'd be back there praying wherever you pray in here, wherever you pray. And something coming against your mind is telling you you need to get out of here, or you're not worthy to be here. Okay, or you're not worthy to preach. On and on it goes, the assault, right? Oh, man. Try the spirits to see whether or not they are of God. Give yourself to God and watch God make the enemy a liar. Watch God, watch God reveal, reveal to you that the enemy has been lying to you. That he is a liar. Come on. Because God is saying just the opposite of what you think. In the name of Jesus. And His power is upon you. His anointing is upon you. His strength is upon you. The devil is a liar. He's a liar. Woo, praise God. Let's lift up our hands one more time and worship this awesome God. God be the glory. To God be the glory. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you tonight for the victories that you have given us individually and corporately, especially corporately. Uh, in this house tonight, Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name. Ask you just to pray for me because I'm teaching you Wednesday night the book of Galatians, and uh, I am learning things. Uh, I'm just going to share this with you. Whew, powerful things. You know, when God looks at our salvation, you know how God looks at it? The way God looks at it, brother, we're individually saved. But ultimately, when you talk about regeneration or salvation in the Bible, it's connected to the corporate body. I am learning that. I did not know that. That's why the enemy will do everything he can to move you out from the corporate body. Because salvation, in God's eyes, is not necessarily just individualistic. It's, it's corporate. It's the church. Of Jesus Christ. Oh, God is good. I said, God is good. All right. I love you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Thank God for everything that He's helping us with and the words of encouragement that He gives us, the direction. And uh, God, God, if He started work in your life, He's going to finish it, He's going to complete it. He's not, He didn't bring you this, this far. If He started a work, He's going to complete the work. Don't think God's going to abandon you, that God's going to quit on you, that God's going to forsake you. If He started work, He's going to finish the work. And he, and he equated, in His equation, He included all your failures too. Not just your victories, but in His equation, all your failures too. And if he began a good work in you, he shall complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Do not give up on yourself. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. God bless you.